By the 1840s, a succession of unusually severe rainy seasons saw the appearance of a fungal blight that caused the rotting of potato crops, the staple food of peasants, all over Ireland. Already living well beneath the poverty line, some estimates have suggested that over a million people perished in the resulting famine, causing another two million to emigrate to the United States, to Australia, or anywhere else they could escape to. Though the government strenuously denied it, eyewitness reports abounded of thousands of tonnes of crops being shipped to English markets every single day by opportunistic estate owners cashing in on a sudden trebling of prices while the population starved on the docks. Appeals and protests were quelled by troops while influential English newspapers, fully aware of the scale of the disaster, passed off the famine in Ireland either as divine punishment for their own wickedness or otherwise as not our problem. The media typically portrayed the Irish as drunken, unruly and ape-like in contrast to other Britons, whose noble duty it was to rule and civilise them. Charles Trevelyan, head of the UK Treasury and chief of official government relief operations, was reported to have said that the famine is simply a mechanism for reducing surplus population. His very public hatred of the Irish made him an astonishing choice to head Westminster's humanitarian programme, which he stalled and delayed on a continuing basis. Even more incredible is that he received a knighthood for his trouble, but in Ireland today he is viewed as a villain second only to Oliver Cromwell. While some debate still persists as to the extent of government and media culpability in the tragedy, most historians squarely view it as an intentionally genocidal British political agenda of ridding themselves of the Irish problem. All this at a time the British were priding themselves on their recent abolition of the Atlantic slave trade and their role as enlightened liberators of an evil Napoleonic Europe. One reason for this peculiar disparity is the suggestion by some historians that the ruling class in Britain at the time was heavily influenced by the writings of Thomas Malthus, a political economist and demographer. Malthus observed that as food production improved, the health and well-being of people also improved. However, he insisted that this well-being was only temporary because the resulting population boom would soon outstrip food production and lead to a famine, which would kill off the population back down to a manageable level. His theory rested on the notion that population growth is exponential while food production is linear, so as these lines diverged, the result would be inevitable instability, famine and societal collapse. Something he viewed as entirely normal, natural, and even divinely ordained as appropriate punishment from God for man's wickedness and overconfidence. This theory led him to condemn any attempts at government intervention during food crises as being not only contrary to God's laws, but also an interference with the natural order of things. Trevelyan was an ardent student of Malthus, so his policy during the famine is therefore no surprise. Likewise, both Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace also studied his works extensively and were significantly influenced by them. Malthus wrote his seminal treatise in opposition to the growing positivity movements arising out of the French Enlightenment. All this nauseating continental optimism was offensive to him, and his essentially morbid treatise found wide support among the insular landed gentry, who increasingly applied the emerging doctrine of what would come to be known as survival of the fittest to their own estates and businesses. The fact that Malthus failed to predict the Industrial Revolution, or factor in the multiplier effect of new technology on food production, 
as well as the reduced birth rate that accompanies urbanization, has eventually seen his theory become discredited, but its prejudicial application against the destitute and hungry caused much preventable suffering throughout the United Kingdom, not just Ireland. Unsurprisingly, the backlash wasn't long in coming, with the emergence of political activism among the poor in the form of trade unionism. Karl Marx was lapping up the discontent and, with his mate Engels, travelled around England liaising with Chartist protesters who were calling for major political reforms to benefit the working class. Much of his later socialist theories grew out of his experiences in London where he took a stick to Malthus, blaming poverty not on overpopulation and limited resources but instead on class injustice and exploitation. Socialism was born, and the English were now copying serious blowback as public opinion shifted sympathies significantly towards the Irish. To highlight the absurdity of the ruling elite's attitudes to the catastrophe unfolding in Ireland, one incident in particular stands out. The Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Mejid I, a firmly pro-European, progressive Muslim ally of Queen Victoria, was so moved by reports of the famine that he transferred £10,000 in cash as humanitarian aid. But British diplomats in Istanbul warned him that since Queen Victoria had herself only donated £2,000, it would be seen as a diplomatic insult. So they advised him to reduce his aid to only £1,000 in order to avoid a scandal. He nevertheless clandestinely sent several ships laden with food and supplies, which apparently had to run the gauntlet, passing major Irish ports to offload them in Drogheda, whose grateful citizens commemorate his act of charity to this very day, even twinning their football club and its colours to a Turkish one. 